Amber, thank you for taking the time to come out here in your busy schedule. We started talking on social media about the concept of preparedness for families. Let's talk about uh, who you are and uh, a little bit about your background and then how you got into preparedness. Well, I am born and raised in Louisiana, so I grew up rural, which I think in and of itself kind of lends towards a preparedness mindset. Maybe don't have as quick access to things. You have to be a little more adjusted to take care of things on your own, you know? And my dad really instilled that in us from a young age too, not with like a fear-based mindset, just you're a girl and you're a little girl, and so you have to take care of yourself sometimes. You can't always depend on other people, so that was really good. Um, I always had interest in health and the human body, so I got a degree in nursing, so I have a bachelor's in nursing. And But my, my big goal was always to be a mom and a homemaker. And um, so my husband kind of made that happen for me and said, you don't, you don't need to work in the hospital if you don't want to. Why don't you just stay home and focus on our kids mm. and focus on doing the things that you love, which are gardening, sustaining, teaching my kids how to live a preparedness mindset. Um, I homeschool them. And then I also do a lot of natural health education. That's important to me. That sounded like a pageant answer. That was so professional. I did pageant. Wow, did you rehearse that? I didn't. Um, you have three kids, right? Three. Like how, have you homeschooled them since the very beginning? Yeah, so Hattie, my oldest, she's eight. Um, when it was time for her to do pre-K, I had a two month old. So I just put her in a little private Christian pre-K and um, didn't really have a bad experience at all, really, but it just didn't sit well in my gut. I knew that I wanted to be the one to teach her. And so I brought her home. And after that, it you know never really crossed my mind again. It was just something that I wanted to do, and it worked really well for our family. And thankfully, my kids are really intelligent, and they pick up on things quickly. And so it's really, it's like preparedness. It's a lifestyle for us. Learning is a lifestyle. It's part of our, our, our daily rhythm, really. You know, you know what's weird is, like, when I see your... Instagram or your social media stuff, it doesn't come across to me as being a political party affiliated thing, right? It's not controversial um, because you focus on preparedness. You focus on the idea that situational awareness, self-reliance, um, and teaching your children are all good things and positive things you should be doing anyway. But I noticed, and we had a, a couple conversations about it, about how people seem to segment or segregate people like you or like me who are preparedness minded into a category that just seems to be fringe and extreme and even right wing in a way. And I don't understand that. And, and from a wom woman's perspective, do you have any idea where that stems from? And then how have you dealt with it in social media? Well, I mean, unique to my situation too, I live in Southern Louisiana, which is conservative. I mean, you're conservative, you know, <clears throat> but yeah, definitely lump you into a category. Um, just, and it, to me, it always comes across as them thinking that there's a pretension to it. Like we're in the know somehow of something that they're incapable of understanding and that we have this massive distrust in the government and distrust in society as a whole. And that's not how we're supposed to live our life. Like and we're paranoid. Totally. Mm -hmm. um, we live in fear. So, like you said, super radical. Just like flinging your guns everywhere. <laughs> you, you don't do that? I do that every morning. I mean like occasionally, but <laughs> <laughs> on a regular basis. But um, I guess it's just because for the most part, people who lean towards the conservative side share those values in taking care of yourself. You know, you go back to, to just the just agricultural, rural, a uh, rural area, rural life. That's how people lean towards was self-sustainability. And so as people started to depart from that and you started to see those, that political divisiveness, um, you had, I mean, you can even look at the election map. You have people that are mainly democratic. It's, it's only in the cities. If you pop up the individual states, all the rural areas are going to be voting red. Um, not that you don't have outliers in those areas, but it's just the way people want their rights, people want their freedoms, um, people value the Constitution, and so they're kind of leaning towards that party that stands for that. Yeah, I always think as a, you know, from the beginning, a business strategy of ours was 
to always explore um, bridging the gap between people who are more liberal and on the left and showing them, hey, if you live in a condo in San Francisco, it's okay to come out and think about preparedness because you got earthquakes, you have you know, devastating um, natural disasters and man-made disasters that you could be exposed to. And just thinking about it will allow you to maybe apply some things to your life that are gonna benefit you in preparedness. And so we were never like politically affiliated, but we're conservative people. And you know, I would consider myself, and I know Kevin Owens' political leanings as being conservative, but also being more libertarian, uh, more about individual freedom and not so bogged down with an affiliation to a party. And I think, you know, like natural catastrophes are an equal opportunist, right? It's going to hand you your ass no matter what. We know. <laughs> um, in your, like, this is kind of weird to, to, to ask, but um, because it probably wouldn't occur to many people, but you said that you took on, you wanted to take on a role as being a mom. Like, that's what you always wanted to be. And, you know, feminists would look at that discussion and, and, and target you as being somebody who's just falling into old, racist, systemic ways, right? I, I've always thought that if you have, if you're with a good woman and you're a team, the kids have to be taken care of. They have to be nurtured. And the best children grow up to be sometimes the best adults. And I say sometimes because there's variables there. But it's important to nurture that growth and development. And when you look at how you tackle the world as a team in a family unit, I don't see anything wrong with tackling it that way. Now, if my spouse made more than me and was able and enjoyed her job and I was able to stay at home and take care of kids, then the roles could be reversed. But you took on that role from the very beginning. And one, where did that come from? Where did that stem from? Um, I'm interested in how that became part of your upbringing. And then when you got into that role and you take that on, are you being targeted or, or converse with by feminist type people who are like, that's not what you should be doing? Yeah, good question. So. Um my mom is very intelligent and she chose to stay home and raise us rather than pursuing a career. And I just saw the value in that. She was there for us every single day, just nurturing us and not just at home taking care of things as a martyr, but really thriving in that life. Um, and there were so many invaluable moments growing up where I knew that I had complete dependence and security in the fact that my mom was there to take care of everything and to teach me um, how to be a lady, really. And I know, I know that that really strikes a bad chord with people that stand on that feminist, um, that feminist, I don't even want to use a word that would come across as, as um, belittling, but on that theology, I guess would be the best way to put it. But for me, if we're all allowed to be who God created us to be, that's what I was drawn to were those qualities in a woman who was strong and intelligent and educated, but was willing to lay down whatever ambition might have looked like for her own sake, um, to sacrifice for her children and to raise them to be decent human beings and to just impart love into their life and to teach them how to love other people. Because for me, the ultimate goal in this life is relationships and loving other people and being in relationship with other people in a really, in a really beautiful way. And um, so I just was drawn to that. I mean, I had goals and, and people who knew me in high school would probably laugh at this because I was most likely to succeed and had all these scholarships and, um, and I got my education and I had big goals and big vision, but truly being at home with my children was just where I got joy. And I'm still able to um, impart love into the world in a way that that seems big and seems valuable and seems more than just a stay at home mom. I get to interact with this community on online um, and I get to, to really go where my passions drive me in preparedness. I mean, I've taught gun safety classes to children locally. 
I get to tutor kids in history locally. And so I still get to do big things. I mean, I'm in Utah sitting at a table with you. So it's not like I'm stuck in the four walls of my home. Um, so I, I was just drawn to it because for me, it seemed like something I was good at. It brought me joy, like I said. And it was a way in which I could I could serve people around me. My husband's better better able to go and serve the world and do what he does because I'm at home making sure, you know, everything functions in that way. And and I want to raise really good human beings who can go out and, and love people and who haven't just put been, you know, fleshed through the system like mom and dad both are working and and that works for some people. It's so hard to talk about without people thinking you're judging their life and and I think as as people may get to know me, they'll see I'm not a judge of of character. That's not what I'm here to do. And I don't ever want my lifestyle to reflect that. I just think we should really lean into what we were meant to lean into and where our gifts bring us. And so, and that's what I did. I feel like people who are insecure about their circumstance or situation that maybe had like a gleaming hope of being that in that circumstance. Like when you're a kid, you grow up and you want to be things, right? Um, but when you speak with it with such confidence because you feel like you're living purpose, it makes other people feel insecure. And I, I think that's where the bulk of those attacks come from, right? When people are like tar- like being mean to you or targeting you, it, it drives me mad because I, I know you as a, a person and then I see the information that you put out and you're not a egregious, you're not disrespectful, you're, you're super professional and super caring about giving the information, but you still seem to be a target in, in a lot of ways. Well, people like you or us seem to be target, a target. I mean, ways. you can't walk through the Valley of Giants without getting attacked a little bit, right? If everybody agrees with you, then you're doing something wrong. So, I mean, I never expected, as my following grew, which I say following, like there's 5,000 5, people. Amber, those are your it. friends. Are you, are you being serious? No, no. no. <laughs> um, you know, as it grows and as people come from Mike Glover's Instagram, every time I get like 200 new people, I'm like, Mike posted something. These mm-hmm. are people, either women trying to figure out why you're posting another woman. There's so many of those. Oh, great. Why is Mike posting about this woman? Let me go follow her. <laughs> Let me track her movement. Welcome. Um, Or men who, I mean, you send some couillons over. They they're hateful when it comes to. Can you say that on air? Is that a is that a proper word? (laughs) Couillon. We have to bleep that out. Just kidding. Um, (laughs) Um, Well, let's 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 (laughs) let's talk about preparedness for your family because um, you are next. I, I would here's here's how I look at this because preparedness people are either hobbyists or they live the lifestyle. And if you're a hobbyist, you do it for your persona, right? You're doing it because you want to uh, illustrate to the world that you're better prepared. So that's a picture, that's a hashtag, but you really don't live it. Meaning you go to the reins and you shoot, and then you have the gun and holster sitting on your nightstand, and then you don't train and you, you just kind of show the world, but you don't live the actual lifestyle. This, this livelihood that is um, preparedness as a family, you live. I, I've seen you live it. So what are some of the things that you think about when you have three kids and you're like four foot tall, right? Like 60 pounds and how you look at protecting as a defender, what you love most? Like how, how, how do you start? What's the start point for that? Yeah, for sure. Well, I think, I think it's a big deal to realize Um, people don't want to think about contingencies because it's scary. And like I explained, my dad was just really prepared in his mindset when he, when he, when he raised me. And and I'm grateful for that because not a day in my life do I think of something with anxiety. I just think, let's be realistic. I mean, for in general, women that stay home with their children, my husband does heavy civil construction. I mean, those are grueling hours. He's gone a lot. So I'm, I'm in charge of the kids' well-being and their safety for the most part, unless you're going to be a hermit and stay at home. But you can only control so much in your environment. You can't control people around you and the world around you and what situations you'll find yourself in. And so I have to level out the playing field for, for myself. And so that, that's where carrying comes in, um, you know, having a concealed carry license and practicing and just making sure – elephant in the room, (laughs) making sure that I'm ready um, to protect my children if need be. But when it comes to all the other situations that aren't as sexy as carrying a gun, um, 
I know how children learn. That, that, that was important to me, the mm. psychology behind how children learn. If I was gonna teach my children, I wasn't gonna do it with a half-hearted mindset. I wanted to know how children learn best, and that's what I wanted to teach them in that manner and using that methodology so that I could incorporate that into every other area of our life, whether that's teaching them how to cook, teaching them how to do chores, and then preparedness too, um, and, and running them through that cycle just constantly and it, and it works beautifully. So, you know, fire safety, even in your own home, mm -hmm. like not sexy, but preparedness, you get into these scenarios that you're not prepared for and no one knows what to do. I mean, it's hysteria. Mm -hmm. So even with little five-year-olds and three-year-olds, if you've walked them through these different situations and these contingencies without a fear-based mindset and making it fun, you have to make stuff fun for kids and you have to celebrate the wins, you know, like just, cheering them on like if we if we can get out of the house in 30 seconds everybody we're going to get through that window we're going to get popcorn mm. and just incorporating that into your life you're conditioning them as children i mean call it indoctrination if you want to but you're teaching them at such a young age like you said to live the lifestyle like they're not it won't be something that they'll just showcase one day for likes and attention. It'll be part of their life. And and it was really important for me to make sure that it wasn't with it wasn't with fear. And I've had so many friends tell me that I watch your videos and my initial thought is anxiety. My parents weren't anxious people. I didn't grow up being anxious about things. And so making sure that I can impart that into their life to where they're just wired that way. Their brain runs that way. Whether it's situational awareness or, or whatever, changing a tire, you know, um, it's invaluable and it, and it has to be part of their life. It truly does. Well, What's interesting is I was thinking the term and you said it out loud as conditioning. Um, we, you know, we focus on survival psychology and like the science behind how you train and how people think, especially under stress, because um, people always forget in the conversation of preparedness that in the worst case scenario, when you're actually going through the motions or the process to save your life or save the lives of your loved ones, you are uh, inundated with, in most cases, an overwhelming amount, amount of stress. And there's an interesting book by, uh, I believe it's John Leach, that was written um, on survival psychology. Super expensive book. I mean, it, it's, it's out of uh, published, uh, publishing right now. And so it's super expensive to get, but he's one of the rare psychologists who just focused on survival and took case studies and determined uh, via these natural, mostly natural disasters, who's at the bottom of the barrel for surviving statistically? Uh, and he, he categorized this in 10, it's called 1080 10, 10 being the top 10%, which is most likely uh, to survive 80%, you know, which just split and divided it into 50 50 based on some uh, circumstances. And then the bottom 10%, like the bottom of the barrel. And children are in the bottom of the barrel for survival because. Um, children have to be conditioned to respond because they don't have the, exp the one, the cognition or the cognitive abilities to process information, especially under stress. And, and it's hard for them to make the right decision, even if they make a decision. So you have to condition your children up to a certain age to react instead of think, right? We're not, you, you want to teach them how to think because there is a likelihood you know, I always use the example on fire safety, for example. If you have a pro word, let's say the pro word is fire, you know, and you say fire and your kid knows if he hears fire at three in the morning and he wakes up, he needs to run to the rendezvous point, which might be the mailbox in the front yard. Or if the fire is in the front of the house, you know, the tree house in the backyard. Well, if he runs into a fire on the way down the staircase, what does he do? Well, if you haven't had the conversation, and, and train them how to think cognitively and to give them options reactively. Hey, if it's a fire in the staircase, remember what we, t what we taught you, run back into the room and then use the rope ladder that we put inside your bedroom. Um, it's so important for people to understand that because when you have kids, a lot of people gloss over the training or even the conversation, right? Because it's a dinner table conversation, but they don't implement a plan of action and rehearsal and identifying how truly those kids respond and react. You, you have something that you've done with your kids 
which I think is unique um, because you talk about everyday carry. And most people, when they, they hear everyday carry, they hear concealed carry guns, scary prepper stuff. But you do an EDC for your kids every day for them, uh, and I think out of a backpack in most cases. And we'll talk about the mobility thing next. But what are things that you, tr you train and equip your kids with for everyday carry? So med is important to me, obviously, with the nursing background. Um, so we all have first aid kits. And I have specific things that I always add to a first aid kit that I, I in my experience, are, are really handy to have. Um, <clears throat> so they have first aid. They have identification cards, which is really important at that age. And my older child can communicate effectively. She has our phone numbers memorized, our full names memorized, uh, but my younger two, they can't yet. It's just an age thing. So um, the ID card has their pertinent information for adults or first responders to be able to say, hey, here's all my stuff. That's right. That's really cool. Do you made those? I made them, laminated them. So if we're, you know, before we go on a trip and I know we're going to be in an airport, we'll go over this with the kids and we'll say, okay, guys, if you get separated from mom and dad, what do you do? And even my three-year-old will say, I open up this bag and I get my card out and I give it to a nice adult. And, mm -hmm. I, and a nice adult means a mom. Find a mom. We just yeah. tell her that. Um, and so... Imagine if you didn't do that with a child and you lost your child in the airport, where do you start? Yeah, what's you your know? contingency? Where, where, do they, where do they go? And, and that for me, that's something that I do every day in every situation. It's just something that my mind goes to is what would happen in this instance. And I don't like a vulnerability, just a complete vulnerability. No one does really. I mean, that's human nature. Um, but not often do people actually address it. It's blow it off. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not good enough for me. We, let's figure out a way to, to, to cut into that vulnerability and give ourselves something that could potentially save us. And so the ID card does that. Whistles, I'm a huge proponent of whistles. So they all have whistles on their little shoulder straps to, and they know that they, they blow it if they feel like they're in a dangerous situation. Also, we do a lot of nature hiking. And so if they wanna you know, run ahead and be independent, they have a certain call that they do, you know, blow it one time long and two times short, and I know where to find them. Mm. So obviously, I don't have a five-year-old running around with a cell phone, but if he wants to get 50 feet ahead of me on a trail in a really wooded area, he still has a way to communicate to me, even though it's primitive. Um, ID cards. I, I have them sectioned out into little bags so that I can easily take a bag out that has like a knife in it and a multi-tool if they're going somewhere where they couldn't, shouldn't have it like church, we picked him up the other day and they were like, he was, he was running around with his knife. So we took it from him. We were like, <laughs> okay, we'll talk about that when we get home. Um, <laughs> lighters. My husband takes the little safety portion off the lighter so that they can light it really easily. Yeah. I know people will probably like crucify me for that. No, but. so they could start a fire if yeah. they get, you know, exposed to the elements. That's super important. Also signal. Um, they have like mylar blanket, just little things that mm -hmm. they could use. Some little um, bungee straps. And then they also have a little bit of money. Um, wow. Okay. Just Smart. some cash and some, a little bit of cash and some, and some coins. I mean, they're not buying a plane ticket somewhere, but like I said, it's part of the conditioning process. It's just teaching them to make sure they have on hand what they need. Um, they have some little glow sticks, crayons. They have like a writing tool, a pencil and a paper, because mm -hmm. that could be important for communication too. So very simple. What about, what about for the tourniquets? What do you, what are you using for tourniquets? And um, you had asked me about the rat tourniquet as well, and, and another tourniquet, which is the uh, SWAT tourniquet, SWAT T. Um, what are you using for tourniquets, and why did you choose to use those specific tourniquets? Well, I had cat tourniquets, and they can use them because they're easy to use. I've practiced with them before, and they work. They do work. I just don't. I don't know if in, you know in a, ba a very bad bleed if we'd be able to have enough of a restriction. But you, you just keep turning the rod. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I find it effective. Yeah, the, one of my, uh, it just occurred to me that, that if a five-year-old, for example, was applying a tourniquet to themselves or to, their, um, to somebody else, um, if they would have the strength or, you know, to bear down on the windlass to turn it out enough, hard enough, to be able to stop the bleed. That's it. I mean, maybe that's something that we'll do in the in future uh, for content. My five-year-old can, my three-year-old yeah. can't, but I mean, manipulatively, Your three -year -old a three-year-old may not gym. be able to, right? We need to focus Get on it that. together. Conditioning. <laughs> but I mean, I, I find the cat tourniquet more effective than the rat. Yeah. Because they're able to use 
the rod to get that extra tension that they couldn't get yeah. necessarily. Instead of a wrap where they don't necessarily have an understanding of how they're effectively right. stopping or compressing the bleed. Huh. What is your what is your everyday carry pistol setup? What are you carrying? Where are you carrying it? Um, you know, I advocate for people to carry in their purse, purse external from their body because if you're driving a vehicle and you get out of your vehicle um, and you had the gun somewhere else, like your center console, for convenience because it's uncomfortable having a rear sight in your belly for your commute. I don't want people to like pull out their gun out of their center console in the middle of target parking lot and stick it in their waistband right before they go in. So having access to a bag is important. Are you a bagger? Do you, do you carry your, your concealed carry in a bag? I do. Uh, sometimes, sometimes I carry it on my person. If I'm in a bigger, if I'm in a larger crowd, um, I normally try to make sure I'm wearing something where I can conceal it. Even for a woman, if that's like a cardigan or a shawl over a shirt with some leggings. I, I use a, sometimes a sticky holster, mm -hmm. and what it does is it just uses the tension from like even your legging band against your body, and it holds it there. Is that like a, is that like a, um, a soft material? Mm -hmm. Okay, that goes in, and then, um, and then your legging, which is yoga pants, um, pushes or compresses it against your body, right? Right. Do you feel, like in your pistol setup, do you carry a bullet in the chamber, or do you not? Yes. So you always carry a bullet in the chamber. And then do you feel comfortable or safe with that setup in your waistband like that? Or does it feel... I do. I do also have a safety on my gun. Oh, okay. Um, I have a Ruger LC9S. Okay. Don't love it, but... It's all right. We'll get you another pistol. That's that's We have to work on that. I think uh, I manipulated my husband into giving me his Glock. Okay. We'll that's that's the solution. I, I recommend, especially for hand sizes, which, which I think is important to reference. Like people go, which gun should I get? And I'm like, what, how big is your hand? Because the, I've seen guys with miniature hands. I have a pretty big hand. You have massive hands. Like, I mean, just from this view, from a few feet away, they're probably smaller in person. I wanted the SIG, the P365. <laughs> Actually, let me see your hand. Let me he, see your hand. I think he tried to buy me a Hellcat the other day. Though. Glock 19. Your hand's set up for a Glock so 19. Big. No, it's not. It's not. It's a small frame Glock. It's not the full size version. Glock 19 would be perfect for your hand. Glock 43 is like midget hands. No offense to midgets, carry that's, Glock 43. That's what he has. <laughs> yeah. Oh, does he? Yeah. The, the problem with big hands and small guns, I feel like that should be a joke or something like that. <laughs> uh, big hands and small guns is that it, it creates overbearing on the gun and actually can impede uh, the ability of the gun to cycle, it, especially with, a, with a, um, a bad grip, a bad acquisition of grip. So you're under stress, you grab your gun, and then your meaty portion of your right hand in a right-hand shooter has it up on the slide of a Glock 43, you're gonna induce more likely a uh, soft cycle and cause a malfunction. Soft cycle, I just made that up. I, soft cycle. I have to shoot, I have to shoot above where I'm aiming with my Ruger compared to if I'm using a, I mean, I'll shoot multiple guns. Yeah. So I can hit, where I'm shooting with like a Glock 19, yeah. but I have to shoot a couple inches above with a with my Ruger. Is that because of the height of the, the slide? Do you think it's the length of the barrel and my hands? Uh, it, there's a whole bunch of factors that it could be. It could even be the zeroing of the, the uh, sights on the gun, and we, we'd have to look at it. Um, when you carry, I'm interested to, to know um, how you carry in a purse. Do you carry the gun in a holster in a purse, or do you carry it Naked in a purse. In a holster. Okay, so how when you go to draw that, one of the one of the issues, and, and this is something that we're going to work on. Look, with Amber, we're going to use all of her expertise, especially with her living this lifestyle, and designing and and developing new equipment. And one of the things I've always been awestruck about is the fact that you would have to buy either a couple hundred dollar purse made for concealed carry which looks the same. Some people can identify that pretty easily. Um, or have your pistol in a holster with no way of retaining it in the purse when you pull the gun. I mean, unless you clipped it into a pocket. Yeah, you could clip it into a pocket, but we've tested a lot of those even with our own holsters, and there's not really a good setup for that. And so I want like a, a trigger guard Kydex uh, piece. I used to use this in uh, Yemen where I would take the Glock put the uh, piece of plastic over the trigger guard and it had a lanyard on it, a 550 cord. I would tie it to whatever I was using. 
a Patagonia fly fishing bag, my jeans, whatever it would be. So when I grab the gun, which would be bare, obviously the people get weird about the guns. Like they, they're like, oh, you would carry that gun in your uh, appendix carry in your waistband over your crotch. And I'm like, what's the difference between that and a piece of Kydex covering it, shrouding it? There is no difference. Um, that way you could access it when you pull it clear from your purse. It, it, and your lanyard's holding it. The lanyard would be holding it and retaining it. But there has to be some testing, some good testing to do that because even the tension that's holding it has to be a, a, appropriate for it. Right. Um, I'm real interested to see that because you're out obviously adding another step when you, when you do that. Um, well, and a lot of women are carrying diaper bags. You know, like yeah. when they get to that point, that season of life, they're eliminating purses, carrying diaper bags. Yeah. Is there, Expensive. are diaper bags like, uh, can they look like normal bags? It's, I, I think the trend is like backpack. Backpack, okay. They're like backpack bags. Yeah, you yeah. could put a collapsed AK-47, suppressed in one of those. In a diaper bag. We'll work on that too. We'll, we'll Next add that. to the wipes. Um, mobility. You're the first person that I saw organically, meaning it wasn't our own network. Like some people talk about mobility and adding things to, uh, adding kit to your vehicle. But when I met you and then you pop the trunk, I was like, what? It looks like, like a mini Costco that you have set up and you strategically put it in the uh, wheelhouse, wheel well of where the spare tire would go. I think that's right. Um, how did that come about? What do you carry in the vehicle and why do you carry it? Well, I try to keep extra supplies of all sorts in the vehicle. So I have med, like an expanded med in there. So I have a sterile suture kit um, just because <laughs> for me, I have like lidocaine and syringes. I mean, that's not something a normal person would carry in there. Um, and then I have food, backup food supplies. So I have like um, beef jerky, some smoothie packets, just things that are fruit, dried fruit that would sustain well. I have a few glass bottles of water um, just because plastic would do terribly in a vehicle. Um, what, why, why, why uh, the glass? Heat. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. The constant sh shrieking and this isn't a BPA a thing. You're talking about like actually, because in the back in Texas or not back in Texas, the back in Louisiana, the heat would constrict and contract it. So glass is a better option too for procuring yeah. water. And if you're just, no, it, these are glass bottles. Yeah. That are filled with water already. Yeah, just yeah. So you can grab and go. Um, yeah. yeah. And just so, yeah, you're not worried about them busting mm. and they're not just leaching nasty plastic the whole time, which if you need water, you need water, Yeah. you know? Um, and then I have just vehicle things. So some ratchet straps, I mean, everybody has jumper cables, I hope. Um, basic maintenance and recovery tool set. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have, I, I love like eye wash and saline, like things you have to use really quickly to clean wounds out that people a lot of times don't have on hand. Um, some hemorrhaging, like stop the bleed type things, tape, scissors, Everclear. Like booze? <laughs> like 99% <laughs> like alcohol, alcohol. Yeah. clean anything. Hand sanitizer, sanitation. Yeah, uh, like, like um, wipes. Mm. that you can use like, um, hygiene wipes. Sorry. Yeah. Um, a little bit larger, like Mylar blankets. Um, so you, you actually upgraded the small EDC stuff that the kids carry, you carry, and then just upgraded the size and the capability right. because of the capacity of the vehicle that you use. Yeah. Um, and then an extra change of clothes for the kids, mm. especially in the winter, you know, socks, pants, shirts. If they were to get cold, that would be a lot more detrimental than in the summer. If they were to get wet. I mean, yeah. if they were to get wet, it would be a lot more detrimental. Yeah. We had talked about some designing of specific equipment that you think should be in the market of survival and preparedness, but doesn't exist. Um, the bag is an interesting one, right? Because backpacks, which are just for kids or the smaller variations of them, aren't well made or well suited for a preparedness lifestyle. If you were gonna design, should I say this? <laughs> should we say it all? If, what are some of the aspects that you would look for in, in a bag that would be manufactured? I mean, I want it to be cute. 
yeah, you know, to fit in, right? Aesthetics is important, yeah. especially for women, yeah. you know? And I think that that's something too, is making sure that it's relevant to women. They don't want to look, they don't want to necessarily look tactical. Yeah. And that's what I get a lot in feedback is people saying like, thank you so much for normalizing this. Mm. Um, hmm. Noted. Noted. Normalizing. That's a, okay, okay. Yeah, because I think. Because I don't think you look at me directly and say. You're a tactician. She's a prepper. <laughs> yeah. She's totally carrying. That's true. <laughs> So you're inconspicuous because you don't have to do Molly and mill spec and all that stuff. So make it more like the lifestyle of what you live. So women, you know, they're like, I don't, I don't want to have to walk around in five eleven tactical pants. I want to get my clothes <laughs> from Nordstrom. Looking on and, women and men, oh, they're gross. And so they want to realize that this is something I can do. Mm. You know, I can be trendy and relevant and a cool mom and still mm. be prepared because there was such a disconnect with that. You know Huge I mean? disconnect. They like you lived in this category or you lived in this category. And yeah. I think that's what you guys are doing is trying to just really blend it. And like you were saying, even with the left people that migrate to the left politically, like this is for you too. Mm. Your life matters too. So you want us to make like the Prada bag Sorry. of preparedness. That's what you're looking I'm for. I'm going to need you to collaborate <laughs> with Louis Vuitton and get us. That would be awesome. It would be the most expensive survival bag on the planet. Uh, we would just a add a thousand percent yeah. and put a med kit in there. Yeah. Um, so compartments. Yes. That's something that, right. Like if you get a, what are the, uh, starts with the J like the Jord, I was going to say Jordash for some reason. Uh, what are they called? The Jensen or the, the basic bitch bags that normal people buy at Walmart. They're like real cheap. Um, Jansport. Jansport, right? That's Jansport. Jansport. So it's a Walmart bag, but if it, a backpack is made because it's made for books, mm -hmm. right? So having compartments internal that have places for specific types of equipment. Even like plates, like a lightweight plate, like the mm. one you gave me. Yeah. That you, you have a space specifically for that. Maybe a space for like a built in, which, is that what you're talking about? Like a yeah. built in clip for your gun? Where yeah. It's built into the Not for purse. kids, but I mean, built in things for children. We're that, talking about women's purses, right? Oh, we're well, just talking about in general. Okay. I mean, general. Well, I mean, there's yeah. a difference. Yeah. Well, let's talk about kids' bags. Okay. Little. They need Very little. little. Yeah. 10 inches. Yeah. Anything bigger, they just, they toss it. They don't want to hold it. They whine, they cry, and you end up carrying it. Yeah. What about load bearing? Are, I mean, ba book bags. I remember carrying book bags and carrying all my books and it being very poor to carry a lot of weight because they weren't load bearing. They didn't have frames, they didn't have the internal frames, soft frames. Well, I would think the point of an EDC too is to try to make sure that you, you get it down, you whittle it down to the basics that they need to carry. Okay, what are the basics? Because it's part what, do you, of what do you think? Med. Med. Communication. Well, which, let's break it down. Okay. Med. A little first aid kit. A little first aid kit. That super glue. They could apply super glue. Mm hmm. Tourniquet. Yep. And then like a little bottle of saline wash is what I always add. That and super glue. Because you're teaching your kids how to disinfect scrapes and scratches, right? Yes. Because that's important. I mean, most, like <laughs> I've seen people do this before, but their kid will get scraped and they'll just put a Band-Aid <laughs> on the scrape, right? So all the debris and crap is in it. And then they put the Band-Aid I mean, on it. Band-Aids like, fix everything though. Yeah. It's magic. <laughs> it's medicated. It's like uh, like a burn. Like yeah. the biggest mistake you could make in burn treatment is putting a bandage on it without some kind of petroleum base or foundation in between or using saline to flush the wound and then using that same approach. So saline, and can you get it in small packets or how does that, or like a small bottle? Well, most of the time you have like wipes that you can use to disinfect, but yeah, I get like a little nasal, I mean, nasal spray, eye wash, it's saline, it's yeah. saline. But the reason why I like the bottle is because with kids, it's so easy for them to push and it's pressurized. And so most of the time, if they're out in the, in nature, their scrapes going to have a little bit of debris in it and they need to get that out of there. Yeah. And so can you imagine like a, a five-year-old giving them a wipe and they have to like wipe yeah. debris out? That hurts. Oh, spray. So that yeah. pre even though it's a little bottle, I mean, yeah. I replace them constantly because you use it one time and there's no bueno. So it, you have that pressure behind it. And so even a little three-year-old could squeeze it. And of course we practice cleaning wounds. I mean, <laughs> we do that around the breakfast table. Are you, are, uh, are you using saline solution for like contacts or for eyes? Can, is that the same thing? Can you use that? Yeah, it's sterile saline, yeah. Okay. Eye wash, but I mean, I think your contact solution has a little bit 
more in it. Mm. Uh, tourniquets. So then you'd have the tourniquet inside that single pouch with the first aid kit. So the tourniquet you sent me, the one that you said you had used on a kid. Yes, in Africa. In Africa. Yeah. That one, it, ta it takes up a very small amount of space. Yeah. Are we talking about the RAT? Nope. Or the SWAT T? The SWAT T. Okay. Um, I just don't know. We'd have to have children practice to see if they could effectively use it. Yeah. The difficult thing with a SWAT T is you have to pull to create pressure when you apply it. And then wrap back, right? And then wrap back. So it, it might be difficult to handle. I, it's weird because I, I always advocated for the rat in many ways for children, but I'm thinking the adult applying to the child. For sure. But now I'm thinking, oh wow, there's a whole thing here where the kid needs to be able to apply it. And his the considerations for that child, including like the strength and how they can handle it, are important. So a cat seems easier because right. cats are very simple. Mine can use cats. Yeah. And, and can they your three-year-old? They fit around their appendages. I mean, to an extent. Yeah. yeah. You know, but like, I, that just may be a thing that maybe a three-year-old can't effectively do. Yeah. We'll teach them so that by the time they get five. But the five-year-old can. They're excellent. Yeah. That's incredible. And, I mean, they take up a little bit more space, but I think it's really the easiest one for them to use. Yeah. Well, okay. So, um, so first aid. First aid. Communication. Okay, what's communication? Um, like a writing tool. Yeah. And a notepad. A notepad. You never know when they're going to need to write something down. You know, I mean, you don't want to think about your children getting abducted, but what if they need to write down location, like street signs they're seeing, yeah. or ask for help, asking for somebody for help because they can't verbalize it. Yeah, our field craft survival kit has has that, and people ask me like, why do you have write in the rain in a in a golf pencil? And I'm like, well, because. The, it's guaranteed the golf pencil is going to work because you have the ability to sharpen it, right? Even if you have to chew on it. But it's not meant for like a Dear John letter. It's meant for, hey, I'm going to take notes in advance. I might have some numbers that are on that paper that are referenceable. Um, like it's like the, the cell phone idea, right? Where <laughs> right now you have a thousand contacts, but do you know one number of one single person in your contacts list? You don't know any numbers. So having the numbers when your phone breaks or you don't, you can't use your phone, and having referenceable um, information that you could relay is super important for kids as well because they can't always communicate. The, the younger they are, right? Um, and then that's where I would use the ID card too. I think that's really important. Do you have the ID, ID card on a lanyard or anything, or no, is it just? No, it's just lands. It's just laminated mm -hmm. to where they can pull it out. I, with kids, did they lose it? Yeah. I mean, I mean, you're saying on a lanyard just in case you wanted to put it on them in certain like if, it, if if like it's dangerous and something happens they could pull it out and put it around their neck and like run around and like sh blasting it in front of adults face faces it's a good idea um it, go over the information that's on the card again it has their name yep. their age um and then i have a space for like any health conditions or allergies yeah you know if you have a diabetic child you want someone to know that yep um and then i have four points of contact why like four contingency points of contact. Can't get a hold of mom, getting a hold of dad, can't get a hold of dad. Grandma, Down the grandma, line. yeah. Yeah, God, it, that's so bizarre. I've never I've never thought about that. Um, I, like I feel like we should offer that in some service or way, right? Like you should be able to go on philcraftsurvival.com, um, email us the pertinent information you want on it, and it's like going to PetSmart and getting a tag for your dog, um, where you depend on that tag to save your dog's ass when he's running around looking for dad, why would you not do that for your children? You just related my children to a dog? I, know, I always do that. I always make that, I mean, people get, I love dogs. I'm joking. They're like my family. Well, no, I mean, it, this is just the beauty of collaborating with people because you don't think of these things until you're in that scenario. You don't think of that until you're out in public with your three-year-old and you're like, oh my gosh, what would I do if someone took them and they couldn't even, she doesn't know my phone number. Yeah. How would she contact me? Wow. You know, but they know you, they've been trained and conditioned. You get lost, you go straight to the card and you show a mom first thing, a, a good adult. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have ID communication, yep. money, money, just money, just teaching them to be self sustaining. How, how much money are you putting in there? like 10 bucks and some quarters, like two bucks and quarters. Okay. That's like, it's weird because <laughs> there's so many things that are here pop. in special operations. We used to do the same thing. Like we would carry, what was it, Kevin or left? left pocket, a uh, crap ton of cash. Um, more than 10 bucks. Yeah, more than 10 bucks, like hundreds of dollars. And, and local currency, depending on where we were. Um, 
a blood shit, and everybody gets weird when I say that out loud. It's C H I T, which is a identification um, um, identification marker for who you are and the communication to that host nation. Um, so maybe a for, in foreign languages or different languages, an identification or identifying marker of who you are and 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 potentially some additional data on there that you can communicate and like, hey, I'm in trouble, this is it. And that's exactly what that card is, right? I'm lost, here's my blood shit, there's foreign people I'm running into, I can't communicate to my friends or my family, this is, this is the comma. And we also carry um, a small little thing of, we individual first aid kits on, is on us, but we carry the, um, like an EpiPen and like a assortment of drugs that we would potentially need in, in a worst case scenario. It's incredible, incredible the correlations because I've never thought about that. Well, you, and and I hate the expectancy of saying, okay, in in utopia, somebody will help my child and give them their cell phone for for them to use. And, and these are the things that I mentally am running into. Like, what well, what if we don't meet a person that does that? And my children have a little bit of cash. Like, can I use your phone? We'd like to believe there's good people out there, but do we? Is that part of our contingency? Like, yeah. Yeah. Like it's going to fall into place perfectly, you know? Yeah. Or, you know, they need a water. Yeah. They, something happened. They are whatever they might need. They just have a little bit of cash for it. And and like I said, they're not buying a plane ticket, but they're learning. I have to take care of myself in every aspect of that. Mm. And now I have the equipment and the training that's going to back, back that up. And as they grow, that grows. Yeah. You know, yeah. $10 becomes $20. For sure. Or um, a credit card. <laughs> yeah. The... The whistle is important too. I, I think it's funny in the military, in our survival kit on Phil, Phil Craft Survival, we have a whistle. Well, nothing sounds like it. Yeah. It, 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 look, communication is, is one of the most important aspects of survival in various forms, verbal, nonverbal, you name it, ham radio, the list goes on. When you have the ability to non-verbally communicate as a child, that's how we communicate with dogs. I mean, I hate to make this correlation, but dogs are similar to children in how you train them conditionally, meaning you have to train them to react and respond based off of stimulus you, and them using their senses. They're not gonna respond through a conversation, right? But they'll respond to a, a sound. They'll respond to um, a pro word, right? So- Well, and that's the way their brain works. They're, yeah they're just inundated with fun and, and sense the sensing things around them. Yeah. And so you need to be able to catch their attention like that. How, what is, what is the, uh, SOP for you for the short burst versus the long burst of uh, sound for a whistle? Well, it depends on where we're at. So if there's another group of people with us that might have their, their own whistles, we have to kind of determine whose sound is going to be what. Yeah. Um, and so it, it normally changes, but for the most part, if it's a long whistle and then short ones, then somebody might need help. But if it's short ones and then a long one, it, we're just like, hey, mom, we're okay, we're safe. You're just saying, you're like, I'm good. Are you so proud that I knew what SOP was? Yeah, I, I, I should have said that. Oh, as much as you guys procedure. are military, I'm a civilian. <laughs> yeah, I should have said that. Um, so the, the commo, um, you're not doing cell phones now as like part of their lives, period. But would you ever consider like a flip phone at a certain age? Yeah, for sure. Like the kind where they could just communicate with us or. Yeah. Have you, have you integrated that yet? Do the nope. kids? No. Yeah. Walkie talkies would be what we use for now. Okay. That's inner communication with everybody in the family, right? Mm -hmm. um, when, when do you think that you would integrate the cell phone or willing to do that? I see some hesitancy on your part <laughs> for, for the cell phone thing. Um, do they there's ever. There's a lot of variables. You, as, a, as a mom. Do you ever let your kids touch cell phones and scroll and click and do stuff? Um, they like to look at pictures. So yeah. they like to look at pictures like of travels and vacations. And I make videos for them and they look at that. But we don't do like play games and stuff. Um, and they're not on. A, the oldest is a eight. Oh, the oldest is eight. OK, so these kids aren't on any cell phones. And you there's thought no I had a child when well, I was in junior <laughs> high or something. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have a 14 year old ever? Yeah. Um, I was going to say 13 year old. I'm, I'm no, playing, sorry. no, they're not. And that's just something that we, we don't want to do with them. We, we just, we want them to see the value in being in life and intentionally being part of life and not needing a cell phone. Because I mean, my personal opinion, 
even as as much as you try to be safe and careful about it, it just it takes some sort of control over them at some point. And yeah, we're trying oh, to avoid that. You know, by I mean, design, right? Yeah. yeah, we um, which is what it was intended to do. You know, we teach or I have them occasionally like look an address up on maps. My older one can do that. Um, just teaching them like what the value in a cell phone is when you do get one and what mom's cell phone can do. And I've taught her how, um, even though I have a passcode, she knows how to get past it if she would need to call 911. Like we'll practice that oh. and stuff like that. I've never thought about that. Like most kids don't know their parents passcode and most parents have passcodes on their phone. Now something goes wrong dad collapses in the kitchen because he has a stroke and now nobody can call any because nobody has landlines anymore that's very interesting so just hold down the button and say call 911. oh you can yeah serial call even when you're locked i never knew that well see and that's just the thing is like that's thinking, every apple iphone thinking through scenario you want to try no, I, I, is it kinda, locked kinda, <laughs> kinda. wow so you could say siri call 911. yeah okay and it will bypass it mm -hmm. Man, i'm learning a whole bunch of stuff today um, lastly, let's talk about your personal philosophies on preparedness. Why, why do you think people, especially women, are so scared to be prepared? I think, and I think, I think women will disagree with me, but in the basic makeup of a woman, you want to be protected and you want to be taken care of. I mean, we have that... I've heard people refer to it as a woman having an extra organ and it's the security organ. Um, and we, and we, we long for that, that protection. That's gross by the way, that, that analogy is just gross. I just gotta put that out there. What? Security <laughs> organ? No, an extra organ. Oh. Uh, but I like, I've never heard that. Like That's, a sense, like a sixth sense really? or an extra or like they, we want security. Like a defender. And women security. might disagree with me, but I know that I do. Yeah. And when I, and I have these conversations with people a lot, my friends specifically, like what, what's the, the holdup for you? Do you think? And putting their mind when people already so much struggle with anxiety, in our in our in our society right now putting their mind in a place where they have to think about being the sole protector of themselves or their children is a place they just don't want to go you know those thoughts would keep them awake at night but for me i feel like the argument like the justification in that is that I think you'd sleep better at night knowing that you could protect yourselves. Yeah. And I've had people attack me saying you know as a nurse you should know better than this you're psychologically ruining your children and <laughs> Wow. indoctrinating them with fear of the world. Yeah. And my children are the most vivacious kids you'll meet. What's that word mean? Full of life. Okay. I mean, they're fun. They're fun yeah. loving kids. They love life. They don't walk around in fear. Yeah. You know, I mean, they'll, they'll verbalize like if there's a bad guy, mom has her gun. Or if mom uses this word, that means there's a bad guy around and we need well, to get behind her. Why do you think like, this is so fascinating to me is why do people think that people who prepare are somehow paranoid schizophrenics. Like, I don't understand that. I think they've had bad experiences, probably. So you think they're insecure? I think I personally think they're insecure about people around them who are being better prepared because they look at themselves and go, well, I'm not prepared at all, so there must be some problem right. here. What are you doing, weirdo? And I, I, Your I, ego I just don't comes get out. It. Yeah. Um, I think what you don't understand, you, you fight. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, and it depends on your personality type. Some people are intrigued and they're like, you know, I want to know more. And then like people that do struggle with maybe um, some confidence mm. in themselves, they'll they'll argue that this this isn't what I do. And that's a problem that we see in general right now. If it's not something that you believe in or something that you want to do, it's crazy, right? Yeah. You're on the other team. Like you don't see the value in it. You don't have any desire to see the value in it. You don't want to even have that collaborative conversation with somebody to see what that looks like. Yeah. But that's what's been so fun about Insta the whole Instagram thing. Um, that's the benefit of social media, right? Yeah. Is people saying like... I didn't, I never thought to look at it from this way. Or like my friends who were super anxious when they think about it in their life, they'll say, I'll say, well, do my posts make you feel anxious? Like, does, is that the feeling that it brings out in you? And they're like, no, it's not. It's like you've digested it for me and you've handed it to me. Like, I don't have to go through the contingency. You've done it for me. And you've said, this is what your kids need to be prepared. But I think that in, in itself is dangerous too, because if you're not living this out with your kids and you just, you're like, spent $150 on the backpack and all its contents, never gonna talk about it again because mm -hmm. I don't want my brain to go there. Like, no yeah. one's gonna know what to do, you know? Yeah, I think the paranoia or the uh, an anxiousness aspect is an actual 
good thing behaviorally. Like it, it's, it, it gives you a sense. Healthy fear. Yeah, a healthy sense of something's changing and you're uncomfortable because of that, right? I mean, like when we teach resilience, we teach that exposure to um, different circumstances than you're used to is going to be what makes you more resilient or better or more evolved or developed. So if, if you feel anxiousness, it might be an indication that you need to pay attention to something. I mean, when I feel anxiousness, I immediately evaluate why am I being anxious in self-awareness and then what has caused me to be that way and how can I get to a place where I'm not? So getting to a place where you're not anxious is not by, uh, you know, which most would, people would do is downtrot people who are better prepared and continue to be insecure about it. I mean, if you want to take a step into preparedness, it starts with education, right? Maybe just listening to the conversation. That's why we have this podcast. That's why we brought you on here because it's important for people, I feel especially women, should hear from somebody who's a strong mother, wife, and woman who's living a more prepared lifestyle, that it's not scary, that they have nothing to fear, and that they're gonna be better served for themselves and their families by taking on some of these challenges. I think this world, the world has presented itself to us this year like it never has before. And, and we see that mental health just blowing up all over the board. And you have to be willing to do the work and say, okay, let's, you have to work backwards. What's this feeling? How do I get away from this feeling? And you have to be willing to do that. And, and some people just aren't. Um, but what, what's the alternative? Just sitting in that space of overwhelm. Um, and I think we see more people now who are willing to, to have that mindset and say, okay, this isn't so crazy after all. My husband wasn't so crazy all these years. Like I get it now. I, I, I actually, you're one of the few people that I go to to find, to look at your content, to judge you, uh, but also to get educated. I like seeing your stuff because I'm like, I never thought about that. And you're constantly doing it in a healthy way and I want people to tune into that. A lot of the things that we do in survival are too tactical to me. Me and Kevin have had this conversation. Like it's not all, all about running and gunning because the probability of that taking place is not likely. But the likelihood of your kids or yourselves being in an accident and then having to figure out how to work through catastrophe uh, is more likely. So look forward to working with Amber for content, for education, and for equipment uh, to better prepare you and your family. Till next time, stay alert, stay alive. Wait, until next time, stay alert. Stay alive. Yeah. <laughs>